Welcome to another edition of the Mexican Soccer Show. This is Wieso from Footmex, and this is an hour-long podcast dedicated to all things Mexican football. Hi, guys. Well, on the podcast today, we have Mr. Naib Moran. Naib, how's it going? Buenas noches. All right. All the way from the FA, by the way. And we're going to go with Mr. Cesar Hernandez. We like to call him Mr. Barrio Hipster San Diego guy. <laughs> hey, guys. What's going on? All right. And from La Perla Occidental, Mr. Tom Marshall. Tom, how's it going? I'm all right. How's it going? Good, 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 good. All right, guys. Well, it is our time. One hour full of Mexican soccer. We'll be talking all about Liga MS. Nacho Ambriz is out. Uh, substitutions here. We'll talk all about it. We'll also be talking about the Europeos. Fabian might be his best week ever in Europa. And also all of the controversy that's going on with Mexico and maybe not playing that second. That's where we'll start right away with everything that's happening with El Tri. Like we know, it's going to be a great, great show. Thanks to everybody that's on the chat already. For everyone that's following us, make sure you follow us on the Mexican Soccer Show. And we'll go ahead and get started and bring it to Mr. Naib Moran. Naib, what is going on? We keep hearing Mexico might not play in the Fortress of Azteca, one of the best stadiums in the world, many soccer players have said. Why, you know, um, Mexico not having that home advantage? But tell us what's going on with the news. Eso de Maria, I think, coming out to say they might not play some games. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it all begins with the fact that nowadays, you know, the team is composed by players that play in Europe. And the fact is that is there is this belief, you know, that they are also affected by the altitude in Mexico City. Um, you know, also, you know, there's nightmares coming. There's a curse at Azteca at the moment because, you know, ever since Mexico lost against the U.S. in that friendly, um, you know, that I, I remember, I think it was Orozco who scored the goal. Ever since then, everything has been really shaky at Azteca. It's not a fortress when it comes to getting wins. You know, there was a lot of draws that friend in the last hexagonal, you know, against teams like Jamaica, uh, Costa Rica, Honduras came to Azteca and, and got a, a win. They also just barely came back a couple of weeks ago and they got a draw um, in these early stages of the qualifiers. So there's this notion that sh they should change it. But the problem with Mexico right now, and I think Tom, you, Cesar, and, and we so can agree is the, the system, you know, the football is not there. And, 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 you know, you can play bad football at Azteca, you can play bad football in Torreon or wherever. I think Mexico just needs to find this sort of optimism and, and good football in its squad guys what's the real reason is it really i mean do they really think that you know not playing at home which i get i think if you're looking at it i think there's a lot of cities that would want to have the mexican national team there monterrey being one of them and either stadium would be great um but is there a real reason tom i mean something that we're not looking at or why they don't want the games could it be the fifa ban that everyone keeps talking about yeah I mean, first of all, quick stat. First 29 World Cup qualifying games uh, home in mo the vast majority in the Azteca this century, so since 2000. Won 28, lost one. Mexico in last eight games in the Azteca in World Cup qualifying, won three, drawn four, and lost one. So only three three wins out of the last eight. Yeah, I think the chant thing is, is something that the Federation are taking very seriously because... You know, it's all FIFA spell it spell it out very clearly what the next um, what the next step is, and it's going to be points deducted. It's going to be play behind closed doors, and so I think that's kind of accelerated this this drive to to perhaps move away away from the Azteca. The other thing I'd, I'd say is that I feel like fans in the Azteca are just so used to seeing the national team, seeing them you know come into the World Cup qualifying. They always seem to get their games, um, and I think the fans are extremely demanding. I think a lot of them are actually America fans. Um, and we know what America fans are like with their club as well. They demand the highest standards. We've seen this week with, with Nacho Ambriz, you know, being 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 forced out there. Um, I think that it, it, it's a negative situation because if Mexico are drawing nil-nil at halftime against a tough Honduras team, the, the, the fans aren't likely to kind of force the team over the line and, and get behind them, they're, they're much more likely to boo right now. So I think that that's uh, one of the big reasons why why the Azteca is, you know, is, isn't the fortress it, it once was. 
And so, that's going to if that's going to continue happening too. Teams are going to continue to step back, as uh, like sit back against Mexico. They're going to continue to frustrate them. And honestly, like it's it's almost normal to see uh, the fans at the Azteca turn against Mexico by you know the thirty something minute by halftime, by, even by like the fifty. But you see you know a serious amount of whistles. You see a lot of people who are jeering at the team. And you do you do think that you know you know Tom, you just mentioned those stats, the mystique, the you know the awe-inspiring, you know, kind of like daunting, kind of like stadium that it once was. I don't, I don't, I think it's gone. To be honest, I don't think. I'm not saying it's completely gone. It's just not the same level that it used to be. And I personally like the idea of trying out, a, especially against a strong. Let's just say, like a against a Costa Rica or United States. I like the idea of going to Monterrey. I like the idea of going to Guadalajara and trying something different. Let me ask you guys a question. El Tri didn't have the seven zero. El Tri had been winning in the Azteca. Do we still have it at the Azteca? Yes, right? I mean, we want to keep that that going. I think it's because it was a bad football. I, th also, I think it's because of a bad football to, team. Yeah, well, also we have to point out something that, you know, other other CONCACAF nations do it, which is to play at a certain hour. You know, it, it used to be, you know, for example, I, rem I recall a U.S.-Mexico game at Azteca at 2 2009. p.m. You know, <laughs> yes. so, so, so I think when they brought the hour to 8 p.m., uh, the, the kickoff time, that advantage sort of dissolved in a way. Um, so it is a possibility as well to make the kickoff at 2 p.m. Why not? Yeah. I mean, you got to use your advantage. and, and yeah, yeah, no, that the, the, whole fi the whole FIFA thing also, it's it's not like if we get banned, if, you know, the Azteca, you know, let's say they go to Monterrey and they else, use it. Yeah. It can happen somewhere yeah. else. It's not, yeah. it's not, I don't think, I don't really think it's a FIFA thing. Um, it, it's, it's in the fact that maybe, you know, the, the FMF just wants to try it out. And I think that's what they should be, this, it should just be allowed. Let's, you know, we've had it at the Azteca. We're going to go somewhere else uh, to give other fans, to give them a qualifying. If they said that, I think it's, it's fine because the whole altitude thing, you know, if we have more players in Europe, it, could that really be an effect to them and they're not coming in? I feel like they're still a, uh, you know, they're coming in four or five days before and I get acclimated or they're used to. I know there were some Paraguayan players and, and uh, Ecuadorian players that were saying, yeah, you know, the, the, the altura definitely um, de definitely is a factor. But I, I, I just don't see the underlying message but I, I think, aside I, from I it. I think when the core of the team is now heavily composed of European players, I think that's a, that's a legitimate argument to say that those players, even if they do arrive, you know, four to five days beforehand, that it does really affect them. You know, that when they've spent most of their time in Spain or in Germany or wherever they're at in Europe, I think that does actually affect them a little bit. And as a much, yeah, I think it's... I, think, yeah, I, think, I, think, I mean, I also, I agree. I mean, but I also think for the opposition teams, I think sports science is so advanced now that there are ways of getting around the, you know, the altitude problem. You're never going to completely get around it, but, you know, Honduras only, you know, trained in Cuernavaca. Yeah of the recent game and then they only went to Mexico City the day of the game they didn't do the usual kind of you know the press conference and going out checking out the pitch the day before and I think we've other, we've seen other teams do that as well um but I said because because I, I disagreed <laughs> slightly <laughs> I think since I said I think he said um you know the, the you know the games against Costa Rica and the United States agree I think those games should still be in the Azteca yeah. I think yeah. what I'd like to see is something like you know like the Italians do, where they go around the country. I mean, I think that game against Honduras, it was absolutely ridiculous to play it in the Azteca. Mexico were already through. Play it in Monterrey. You've got a beautiful stadium up there. You know what I mean? You, you're gonna you're gonna sell it out. You're gonna create a real atmosphere. And you're gonna get people who don't get the chance to see the national team a lot. Um, so, Tom, so Tom, would you would you prefer? prefer going up against, say, like a Panama or a Trinidad Tobago in Monterrey or one of those yeah. teams in Guadalajara. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And then when it, when it comes to the big games, yeah. because then I think the fans in the Azteca, when it's the United States, they're a lot less likely to turn on the team. Mm -hmm. um, you know, no, I think they can no, still create the do you, do you think maybe it's got to do with the venue? They're not selling it? They're, it's not making enough money um, just to change it around. It, I, cannot, I can't really think that the FMF is not going to have the games because the fans will turn on them. Let me, let me throw something out there, and this is going to sound a bit wild, but you know, it's something that you see a lot in the Mexican press, not exactly related to all about football, but um, the power of Televisa in Mexican society is, is maybe being weakened now. 
you know, we've seen their traditional mm. model of, of becoming this media conglomerate has been weakened because, you know, there's other forms of, of doing what they've always done, like, you know, the telenovelas and obviously the football and stuff. Now you've got like Netflix, you've got outside competition, you know, it's a much more open market than it was, you know, 15, 20 years ago. So, you know, I'm just throwing out that out there as well for maybe is one of the reasons that, 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 that maybe it's not as tightly controlled as it once was. No, definitely. Um, I still think that if we still have an advantage, I mean, it used to be the smoke, it used to be the altitude, but it really came down to 100,000 people breathing and, I mean, yelling. I mean, it's not even 100,000 anymore, is it? No, no, yeah, 80,000. I think that that's 80, after 000, the death. Yeah. It's 80,000 still a pretty big amount of people <laughs> of, 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 of it all. I think it has to do with, with the soccer team. I think, I think Mexico hasn't done well in the Azteca, if you take those stats, Tom. And because I've had some bad decisions either with coaches or however it is with players, you, you, I mean, there's a reason why we haven't done well in the Azteca um, starting from Chepo era. But the fact that, you know, fans are going to yell at you or it's going to turn on them, I think that's going to happen. I think that'll happen anywhere, uh, you know, if, if, if they see bad football. I've seen that in, in other stadiums too. It's just louder in the Azteca because there's 80,000 people. I, uh, I, just, I just think whether it's, whether it's Costa Rica, whether it's U.S., whether it's Trinidad, to maybe like hundreds of I think it's worth a try to to at least expand, yeah. at least try a Take different stadium. I, 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 I don't... The U.S. not going in the Azteca. I mean that 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 we have to have our most important games there. I mean, and I think maybe they will. Maybe they'll make a Panama, or uh, but all of these are going to be taken lightly. Um, play, I think play, play, I think it's the, a bad decision. The new Toluca Stadium, <laughs> as the, the highest stadium in Mexico. I'll say, bring it over to the Estadio Caliente. It'll be, it's, it's like a 15-minute drive from my place. It'll be great. <laughs> bring it over to Mexico. Oh, actually, how uh, obviously that's not practical and it wouldn't be ideal, but how fascinating would be a Mexico-USA game in Tijuana? That'd be, be very wild. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be and, interesting. And oh, artificial but, but, turf? But one of, yeah, one of, artificial one of the turf? main points, though. <laughs> Uh, re regardless of what venue they use, uh, you know, the situation with El Tri is not that optimistic. Yeah, that's I'd what say. it is. Mm -hmm. That's you know? what it is. And, 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 it's, and it's just um, the 7-0 the was just a huge blow because before that, like you said, we saw everything was running smoothly. Yeah. But now, you it know, it, it's, it's all uh, temper, not tempestas, no, a huge rain. It come, yeah, it comes down because, you know, it's their bad times in Mexican soccer right now, which... It always happens in the hex. So maybe they're they're coming in and they're trying to change and it the up. The hex hasn't things. started yet. Yeah, I mean, and, and, I, and I think... I looking already feel like negative about the hex. And I, you haven't played the friendlies before the hex. <laughs> <laughs> well, even, I mean, bef I mean, if you're looking at it, the, I mean, qualifiers, you know, the qualifiers before the hex, it, um, that's, I mean, we won El Salvador. Uh, so it's, it's, I know that it's, I think the FMF is either trying, I'm trying to really you know, dig my head around like how and why the real reasons of it doing it. It could be outside of football. Um, it could be, I don't know. Uh, it could be many things, many things. Yeah, I, think, I think it is many things and they're all just kind of pointing in the same direction, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, you know, it's like, hey, you know what? We're going to try some qualifiers out in, in Monterrey. Give the people in Monterrey some time. Do you think, is anybody going to be mad? No, you know, that's the reason we're doing it. Especially in the uh, new stadium, too. I, yeah. I, would love to, I would love to see a game there. Just to, but I, it, it comes down to the U.S., Costa Rica. It's, it's a psychological thing, something that the U.S. does really well against teams, against Mexico, bringing it you know, to Columbus. And um, the U.S. has not been able to win in the Azteca in the qualifier, in the qualifiers, in World Cup, which is different than a friendly. Um, and I think it still gets to them. I think the Azteca is big. I think 100,000 or 80,000 fans, you know, in the U.S., it, it, they still have not been able to win, even though they've had better soccer teams uh, during the Hex, and they still haven't been able to win in the Azteca, and um, you bring the U.S. to that time. But yeah, and I, I agree with, with, with Nae, bring it at 2 p.m. It was great to see Landon Th Donovan, you know, using oxygen masks in the middle of the game because it, or, or being, you know, I know I heard he was sick or whatever, but there were all these players that – take oxygen to Mexico and they blame the smog and all this thing. It's the environment, the same thing that Central American countries do to Mexico. Um, you know, that's how it is. Just like the U.S. is going mean, to take you, you Costa see, Rica. You see in Liga MX with Pumas, you know. Pumas yeah. is, uh, has won all of its games uh, at, at, home? at Seu, you know. And, yeah. and one of the reasons I think is that, you know, it does affect teams like Monterrey that come from, from the north, you know, to acclimate to this, to the zone. You know, you see, for example, um, Cholos, 
Cholos was off of Tijuana for 10 days and they got two draws. Now they got the draw against Pachuca, which is a good one for them, I think. But they 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 couldn't get the win. But I think it does affect them the, the changes of 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 geography, no? Definitely, definitely. Um, well, there it is. I mean, it, just really quick, U.S. does an advantage too, taking Costa Rica to Denver, and, and I mean snowing. because they've never Literally seen snow. snow. Where there are players that have never seen snow in their life. You know, yeah. some of the players like it, it. It's it's part of it, and that's why we're going to Columbus, which is just officially announced. And uh, there's a psychology about it, and I uh, I I really think that the U.S. Costa Rica those type of games are still going to be in the Azteca. But again, it'd be great to see some clarity from the FMF. Things that you wish happened all the time. Uh, let's move on and let's <laughs> talk about uh, Europeos. Uh, great weekend for one individual, at least everyone's talking about, Mr. Fabian de la Mora, uh, who is now, if you go to uh, Foodmax Nation, and I think I retweeted it also, could be the player of the week in Germany. So vote and, uh, you know, it's kind of like Yao Ming winning player of the week every Every day in the NBA, uh, uh, I'm sure. I'm sure Naive knows all about that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that was <laughs> something to watch. <laughs> Why? And so maybe let's do it. Let's bring the forces and bring Fabian. Can you imagine Fabian, the best player in Germany for one week, uh, in the way that he's at now? But uh, to tell us more about the Europeos, Mr. Cesar Hernandez, give us a little wrap up of what you saw in the morning, waking up really early for you, uh, especially for those early Chicharito game. What's up? Yeah, I woke up like around four that day. Uh, okay, so let's. Let's just talk about this game. So building up to Frankfurt versus Leverkusen, obviously the focus was on Chicharito. They, of course, included, you know, Marco Which Fabian. Is, you know, he's back. He still has a little arm injury. But, of course, you know, they included uh, Fabian. But you thought it was just because of advertisement. You know, he's another fellow Mexican. You put that guy in those tweets and those images and those videos, and they, they're more than likely to get retweets. He got his first start of the season. That was surprising in itself. You know, you wondered whether he was going to make uh, take advantage of it or if it was just going to be the Chicharito show. I still thought it would be the Chicharito show. But what ended up happening was Marco Fabian ended up being the best player of the match. He ended up scoring a goal. He ended up getting an assist. He ended up overshadowing Chicharito, who also had a goal. But Chicharito then missed a last-second penalty. I should say not last second. It was a late penalty, which could have gained a, lot, could have gained a draw for Leverkusen. So it's great. Uh, it's that, you know, Fabian who, you know, beforehand he wasn't really one of manager Nico Kovac's favorite players, got the start, got the goal and assist. Allegedly. And now, and now, now the ball is now in Nico Kovac's court. You know, it's like Fabian proved that he could do very well. Fabian did an excellent job, and now it's, it's interesting to see if he's going to continue to get starts. Fabian de la Mora, does this surprise you, Tom and Naive, of Fabian having a great game and, and doing amazing things? I mean... The quietness. Of that. It, does, oh, I don't, it doesn't surprise. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't surprise me. I think Nayeb is like a great talent, and he's got these amazing games. I mean, put La, Fabian de la Mora gold, and you're going to be amazed of what this guy can do. But is he consistent enough to do that? That's the, been the real question. And this is the guy yeah, that, I that mean, Pep Guardiola said he was like amazing for doing a you know the bicycle kick against Barcelona. I think I think we have to give. I, I spoke to him before the Bundesliga season. Um, and obviously he was, he was, you know, I'm settled now in Germany. I, I just am waiting for my chance. And he was saying the right things. You know, he seemed like he was focused. That he knew that, you know, this was a big season for him. Uh, and to be fair to him, it was, you know, it's the first time he's played in it this season. He can't do more than what he's done. I mean, that's all you can do as a player. And it's, it is diff it's difficult in the Bundesliga. It's difficult in Germany. Fabian was saying, you know, it's so physical compared to what he's used to in Mexico. And it's taken him, you know, the first six months of his time there just to adapt. So, yeah, I mean, like, like Cesar said, what else What else can he do than, mm -hmm. you know, be the, the hero and, uh, and the team winning the three points? So I think he has to be back in the team. I think it's Ingolstadt um, on, Tuesday, on Tuesday. So... Uh, but yeah, I mean, Fabian's career has been a tale of unbelievable headline moments followed by, you know, inconsistency. So obviously between <laughs> Fabian has to take this, he's 27 years old now. And if he wants to actually live up to the talent that he has, that he's been blessed with, then, you know, now's the time he's got the opportunity now. Yeah, you know, I think I think it's 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 quite interesting when we analyze what has happened since 2012, because I think Marco was one of the main, you know, protagonists in that gold medal team in the in the under 23 site that was led by Luis Fernando Tena. Uh, because after that, after that Olympics, 
you know, there were rumors that Wolfsburg was actually interested in, in Marco Fabian. So the Bundesliga yeah. had been following him for many years. And then the, the, the option to go to Europe came in a moment of, in his career where we, when we thought that it was over, that, you know, he was going to be coming out of Chaton Enriquez. Look where Chaton is right now. He's in second. We finally division. given up on Chaton. Is that official? You know, Everyone's yeah, giving yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. I don't know who's still. It's yeah. sad to say, but I think, I think, you know, All right, cool. We all agree on that. <laughs> Sorry, Nayib. You know, now, now Marco, you know, he's in Frankfurt um, challenging himself. I think it's important to emphasize that because there are players of the Mexican game that are not challenging, uh, challenging themselves. They're taking the easy route, in my opinion. And Fabian is not taking the easy route here. I mean, this is a coach that didn't like Mexico because it reminded him that Mexico easily beat his Croatia team. Allegedly. You know, so, so all of these things that he had to go against and, and get the start and prove with goals and assists, that's a, that's a great step in the right direction. Um, you know, but let's see if he can maintain the consistency, like Tom said. Yeah, exactly. I think that's the big thing, like Tom says, that we've seen it multiple times where Fabian does something beautiful, amazing, miraculous. But I can he that. not only could he not only could he do that, but can he also gain the trust of Nico Kovac? So I think it's going to be difficult for him. I, I think it's going to be a very very tough challenge for him. Well, he was applauded. He was, uh, you know, I think the crowd liked him watching the game. I was watching the game and uh, standing ovation, uh, his goal. So. Um, I, I still wouldn't be surprised if he's on the bench, right? I, you know, it's we expect him to be. He hasn't been playing. He's given the opportunity. He did, but Nico might be all right. You know, this is what this is what I can see, and and my and and could come in as a sub and and do great. And that's how you get the confidence of a coach, not just one performance. And, and um, real, real, well, real quick mention to Chicharito. It hasn't been a nice start to the season. You know, they they drew right in the Champions League against uh, the Cheska. Um, and, and now, you know, another loss in the league, um, you know, it's not running for Leverkusen at the moment. Mm -hmm. He's still, I mean, it's still considering his injury and the fact that he couldn't, he didn't start at the beginning of the season. I think he still has a couple of goals and an assist. So I think it'll just, little by little, and Kevin Voland, uh, Voland, I don't know how to pronounce it, but uh, who was working alongside him, is supposed to be pro like providing a lot of distribution to him, providing him assist. I know he was injured as well. It's actually kind of funny. He has a little bit of an arm brace too. So I, I think I think it's gonna take a little bit of time for for Chicharito to get to get that momentum going with uh, I also, with Bayern. I was watching it uh, and I was watching the game and mostly was it last weekend or was this his first week back? Dun, dun, dun. I think it was a, I think it was a second. second one. Yes, because last week yeah. yeah that's right I was watching when when I think that guy scored a, a hat trick right, um and and I was watching and it looked like Chicharito has drawn a lot more defenders. He's and they've seen the quality this guy has. And it, when he gets to the defense, it just feels like he's he it, it, he's not the normal when he's always out and he brings it in or he tries to to get behind defenders. I, it, two weeks ago, when I was watching the, his goals, um, the score from the other guy, um, forget his name, the really young kid that's that got the hat trick. There's three players around Chicharito at all times when they were attacking, and I feel like. It's kind of that old NBA move when you're double teaming someone, someone's going to be wide open, but it's going to be a different type of season for Chicharito where he can have more assists. And I guarantee you, I have more assists this season um, and giving the likes of scoring somebody else. But ultimately, Chicharito, I know you watch Mexican soccer show, bro. You have to make those penalty kicks. Um, <laughs> he, was we've, off by, he was off by inches. Uh, I not, not, not to like forgive Chicharito, the big like, hey, I teach you whatever you do, you're fine, man. You break the law, it's cool, man. We're cool. We're we're best friends. I'm not gonna like not <laughs> forgive him for that. No, but, like... but he, it's like everyone. It's the game winner. We've seen it before when it the comes equalizer. to what pressure. Is the, the equalizer. Sorry, yeah. sorry, the equalizer. Yeah. It's, we've seen it before when it comes to to the high pressure Chicharito missing penalty kicks, and if the team is uh is you know is putting all of it you know on Chicharito in the way that he's scoring he's a you know the the, the highest goal going for his first team last season obviously he should take it but uh hopefully we see happy he did score a goal and I thought it was a great goal uh typical Chicharito moves uh moves to the uh, away from the from the uh from the goalkeeper and is you know I think it was a tunnel too where it went through but uh, and good just for to him. just to conclude on on this fact cuz I mean it's special that two Mexican players were on the same match in the Bundesliga I think this is the league for the Mexican players. I mean, I think when we saw Pavel Pardo, what he did there, you know, won the championship with Stuttgart alongside Ricardo Osorio, that was a moment. And, and you know, there's young players, in my opinion, that could easily fit in many of these Bundesliga clubs. So hopefully this trend continues because I think it will be helpful for the Mexican footballer. It's not yeah. the same. It's not the same level. I feel like you say the same for the Eredivisie. Yeah, I, I like the Eredivisie yeah, as more well. more competitive for a lot of than the Eredivisie. Yeah. 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 
Well, there yeah, is but guys. See, yeah, it's, a, it's a better level, though. It's a better level. Oh, yeah. They, 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 you oh, can't compare it to the other. I think, it, I think it's, a, it's a leap up, especially for something that's bigger. And the thing, clubs. You know, it's like, it's like Pavel Pardo says, you know, whenever he's interviewed, he's always like, you know, Bundesliga club looking at, at Mexican talent, but actually I spoke to Pardo recently and also Fa and also obviously Fabian, and both the, said the same thing that the it's price. the high prices that yeah. yeah it's the high prices that the the Liga MX clubs put, are putting on players that stops that more of a flow over well, they, to Germany. But that'd be well, great to see more more Mexicans in Germany. A perfect example. Tom, isn't that they're paying a lot higher prices? I mean, in Mexico to players, regardless. I mean, regularly, right? Yeah, I mean, Jürgen Damm's the, the perfect example. Exactly, yeah. You know, Tigres outbid German clubs, and we're seeing that increasingly now in the Mexican game where the Mexican clubs can outbid a European club. Exactly. Well, it becomes, I mean, the league, and, and there's that. Um, to get to be finished with the German league, I'll throw it out there. Who has more goals, Pulisic or Fabian? No, didn't Pulisic, score, Pulisic. Like, didn't Pulisic score like 53 over the weekend or something like that? Overall? Pulisic and Chicharito, <laughs> is he at that level now? Watch out nah, for this kid, 17 awesome. years old. Yeah, everyone's hyping him up. Uh, good it's it's, for, it's uh, really similar to sort of, not not at the same level, but you know, when you see the fact that he's actually made and done good. in Dortmund, I mean, that's, that's, that's huge. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, he's, he's, he, sort he's, like Giovanni. he's sort of like Giovanni dos Santos. He was made and bred he, in, in Barcelona. And I'll give was, you this. Uh, it's exciting to see the U.S. soccer pr produce a talent like that. And, and he's going to, I think he's going to be a headache for Mexican defenders. And that's good. I think it'll make us better. Um, but, uh, you know, hopefully, ho hopefully it doesn't. But at the same time, um, we'll see where this kid goes. And I, as a rival, you know, we're definitely watching on that. So good for the rivalry. Um, let's go ahead and go into, uh, Raul Jimenez. Um, he's injured right now. Yeah. He's injured. Uh, Fiorentina. Tell me about yeah, oh yeah, Carlos, Carlos. Yeah. So, uh, Carlos Sancelli, he made his debut, uh, last week in a Europa League match against PAOK. Uh, it's kind of funny to say that a lot of PAOK. Uh, uh <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but it was I was impressed. I know uh, Naive could probably back me up with a little bit of this too because I saw that he was watching the game. It was uh, he was confident. I was a little bit worried. I was still trying to figure out his position because uh, Fiorentina were playing with a, with a you know like a back line of three players. Yeah. It seemed like he was pushing higher up at first, almost as if he was like a right mid during the first. I want to say like five to ten minutes. But as the game progressed, it was very clear that he was a right center back. But he did a good job. He was confident. He was composed. He did well, you know, passing with the, you know, connecting with his, with the midfield and defense. And I was actually, he wasn't the standout player. He wasn't. Did you fall asleep, Cesar? Did you yeah. fall asleep? Let's be honest. Dude, I, dude, some of those games, some of the I'm early just saying, games. I have some not. Early, I'm not going to lie. Some of those early morning games, God, I mean, I like, I, I, I definitely fall asleep. I, 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 I remember just watching the Italian league and I've fallen asleep in every match that I've tried. No, but, but I think, I think, I think um, one of the aspects that, was really admirable from Salcedo in that match is that tactically he's really driven. I mean, I think he knows what he's supposed to do uh, because it's not easy to all of a sudden just jump in this back line of three and play alongside excellent defenders like like uh, Gonzalo and 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 um, right now I don't remember the other one, but it's Italian defender, great defender as well. And, and all of a sudden just take leadership, you know, because Salcedo did know about the back line of of, of three or five, however you want to call it. When he was coached by Piojo Herrera, unfortunately, Piojo Herrera didn't start him as much, you know, in, in that Copa America in Chile in 2015. But he he knew a lot about that role. And now I think it's, they're taking him little by little. I mean, because he hasn't started playing minutes in, in Serie A, but in Europa, he already got some minutes. Good for him. Uh, before we finish, uh, Real, uh, Real Sociedad also with, against Villarreal, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, great so there, more Mexicans playing. Yeah, so over the weekend, so, I mean, Villa rounded up beating uh, Real Sociedad 2-1. Uh, Carlos Vela, he actually got his first start of the season. This is a Carlos Vela who, you know, we all wonder what his dedication, his determination. 90 minutes. Was. Yeah, he played the full 90 minutes. It wasn't the, his best game, but he still, you know, I, as I mentioned uh, through a recent article, I felt like he was a little unlucky to get, uh, to not get an assist. I think he provided some excellent passes, but... Let's see if this continues. I think if we if Bella wants to return back to the national team, and you saw that tweet that he sent out for the uh, you know for Viva the, Mexico with yeah, the jersey and whatnot, you know, so that maybe 
maybe we're all reading into that way too much. We probably are, but if he wants to return back to the national team, he's going to have to get more consistent minutes. He's going to have to regain a starting role, which is really weird to say when you consider what he used to represent for that club when he was the player of the season, I believe, back in the 2012 to 2013. Yes. So yeah. So we'll we'll we'll, we'll have to follow Val. Just hope that he gets more minutes and hope that he, you know, continues to actually have that dedication that we're still worried that he has none of. Carlos Vela will tweet, you know, a picture of a Chihuahua, and everyone is going to get hyped up that he's coming back of, of the national team. <laughs> is so, he, where is he moving? Is said he he's going. He's, he's going to you know Juarez FC. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, to kind of just wrap up all the Mexicans abroad, um, Villarreal has a big game against Real Sociedad. Jonah, right? We were talking about it before the Villarreal, game starts. Villarreal, Real Madrid. Uh, next, uh, sorry, next Real Wednesday. Madrid. Yeah. yeah. Real Madrid next Wednesday. Uh, Jonathan Dos Santos against the greatest. Uh, you know, great, great team right now. He didn't start. Maybe, you know, we were talking about this. He could have a start in the next game because he has a goal. He, he's playing the game and he's in, in, uh, in that. But hopefully we get to see him in the middle of the week, right, uh, Naib? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think um, his start, he also had an injury to start the season, uh, as it's common for the most part with the Dos Santos. They usually have injuries, <laughs> muscular injuries. They can't. Oh, it, it was a deal with the devil his, his brother and his dad made. You cannot have but, one healthy Dos Santos. But, but that's I think, what it uh, was. You can only have one healthy Dos Santos, and that's it. <laughs> but, but I think the performance uh, he had in the Europa League against Zurich was worthwhile. You know, he scored a goal. He also got an assist. Um, sort of similar to Marco Fabian's performance in the uh, on Saturday. Working in that with regard. Pato too. Like, I'm still not used to that. We're seeing Pato up there. Yeah, right? yeah. Pato, Pato's actually doing well over there and uh, has sort of having a renaissance to his career. Uh, but but yeah, we'll we'll see what happens. I mean, of course, we haven't put it on the table, but I think that tweet that Giovanni put after that match is is also reason of of probably you not know, debate of concern or what the heck's going on in the FMF. So we don't know if, if, in fact, we will ever see them back in the national team. I mean, there's, we don't know. So if, if yes. he's doing great in Europe, it would really stink if he can't play for the national team for do a reason. You remember, do you remember the tweet controversy before Osorio cut in with the Los Santos brothers? Yeah. With the Open? With, you know, there's, there's, and, you know, one of the reasons there's discipline and then and, and it was no. It's kind of coming back with Jonah now tweeting, you know, Gio and, and Vela, those three guys, you know, there's something there with the FMF not be able to come in. So um, one of them saying, hey, I want to come back. And the FMF say, no, we, you know, the reason why they're not there is because they're, they're not doing well. And, well, they never asked me. So there's always drama. There's always yeah, drama. It's worse, worse than that, though. I mean, they've actually, the FMF in Osorio said that he'd rejected the call, up, which, yeah. which is a, it's a, lot, it's a lot worse than saying, oh, you know, he didn't get in contact and stuff. I mean, that's... That's serious, and this, yeah, there's definitely something going on. I think I read somewhere that that Giovanni isn't speaking to or, won't, or hasn't spoken to anybody from the FMF. That the only contact he's had is with, directly with Osorio. I mean, yeah. obviously that's only a rumor, but I mean, I mean, I don't know. It just annoys me all this because I just <laughs> wish they, I just it, it really annoys me because if you've got a problem, then just come out with it. You know what I mean? Let's yeah. let's have it. Like, it's the same with Vela. What was Vela's problem? I mean, I feel like. Vela's career with the national team is, I mean the first of all he's got to start playing well in Spain but if it is if he ever is, is to be anything with Mexico it's almost like he's got to come out and say what happened and then put it behind him and move on at the minute it's just like this open book where it's just annoying it's just you know what I mean it's really annoying I have, just over the years it's like that family has had such like a beef with uh, with the FMF whether it be I wrote about it recently whether it be you know, being left out of the call up for one of the World Cups, whether it be being fined for that one party, whether it be from that tweet about the Bioko incident, whether it be there's just there's just so many little dumb things and I just wish I I wish they would just resolve they need to resolve, especially I I feel that needs to revolve, resolve because you know, you could really use a player like Jonah in the national team. I think Gio, I think he's a great bench option. I think they still need him as well, but someone like Jonathan Dos Santos in that defensive midfield position, we need someone like that. All I right. generally think we need we the, need Jonathan Dos Santos. I have an exclusive. Here we go. The yeah. day that that uh, Osario, Osorio was announced, I forget where I was. Where was I? Where was I? Oh, in the Coliseum. Um, and uh, Daddy Jos, Dos Santos, the Senor Dos Santos, was there. I actually got a chance to speak to him <laughs> about Osorio, and he said he was happy, he's ready, and about you know Jonah being on the team. Um, 
of saying that. So I don't, I mean, I don't know if that there's a beef or not, but I know that, that, that he was there. In fact, I got kind of looked at cause I took a picture of him and we're not supposed to take pictures. Um, <laughs> but, but it, it, it just kind of, there is something, there is something there now. Um, who knows if, if that's ever going to get resolved, but the whole Bella thing. And here's the theory that I have also talked to a couple of people um, that kind of know, and not to put rumors out there, but the whole Bella drama thing, whatever happened, had what they're saying, what I, I think it also happened, had to do with some promotores and some advertising. The, you know, it's his, his, the money that he gets for certain brands that he has to do not align with the money that the FMF can. And he can't, for example, and I'll put this really, he can't have Nike shoes and Adidas, you know, and he gets paid for that in Europe. And there was something there during that time where he said, I don't want to go. And the FMF said, well, he, he doesn't want to go. And there wasn't any other reasons what it could have been something where it's money involved. Uh, yeah, if that's I mean, true, and it's, and it's just strange. True, I'm, I'm quoting soccer. If that's true, <laughs> no, 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 no. It's true. Yeah, I, no, but, but if you remember, if you remember the when 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 that when he got in trouble with Real Sociedad because he went to a concert. You remember that? Yeah, of course. Yeah, that yeah, was yeah. because that was because of, of marketing reasons that he was there, and that oh, was be, that was because he had to go uh, because the same marketing firm of his uh, I think Griezmann, right? Um, also paid him to go to that to that to that concert. So, but, it, but the it, thing here, he's the, that type the, of real quick, uh, what, 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 uh, what Tom was saying, it is annoying because, for example, you think about the situation there with Vela in 2014 after giving an impeccable season with Real Sociedad. Imagine if he had gone to the World Cup and, and done good over there with Piojo Herrera. I mean, he already liked Piojo Herrera, it was pretty obvious, yeah. you know. Right now, probably Vela wouldn't even be in Real Sociedad, he'd probably be probably partnering with Griezmann at Atletico de Madrid. Why not buy the two when for one, basically? That was that was an idea that was thrown out there in, in Vicente Calderón in, in 2014. Why not bring Griezmann and, and Vela together to, to Atleti and just put them there and, and we should... That could be the case right now. And what we see right now is just a descent, un descenso, a decrease in his career that we don't know where he's going. I mean, we actually I mean, thought I think, he was going to be in MLS we, at this point. I, mean, I, think, I think we do know it's Major League Soccer at some point. <laughs> yeah, that's just, it's just inevitable. It's inevitable. Orlando, we already know that. Orlando, he's going to be in Orlando. All right, guys, enough of this. Columbus. Oh, he's going to Columbus. <laughs> he's definitely going to Columbus. Are <laughs> we getting go, oh, get a hat trick at Columbus? That's right. <laughs> All right. Uh, Joanna Sanchez asked, uh, asked the, the group, when does the, uh, the roster for El the Hex – start uh, or given and it's usually uh 20 days for the europeos have to be uh, known and then uh, a week before the game starts so oh that's great sometimes because some of those clubs will tweet out be like congratulations jonathan dos santos yeah and we're like yes you're in the roster <laughs> all right guys let's talk about a big big news over the weekend take the europeos take liga uh take El like aside. One, one, one second uh oh, Ochoa had a decent game after granada went down the 10 men and it was a much better performance after making that one mistake oh that everybody was justifiably justifiably criticizing him for. It was one mistake. People make mistakes, but it was <laughs> nice to see him. It was nice to see him followed up with a decent performance when his team went down to ten men and he had some crucial saves. I think. All right. All right, that's it. I hear there's something wrong that the he memo moment. that his something's up with his eyes or or he had a. <laughs> no, no, I'm not kidding. This is legitimate. His hair is just. He needs no, 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 no. Like um, contacts or something wrong with his eyes. Like they what? like. Yeah, like they're they're just just remember what I just said. I think I think you're, you're I think so many conspiracy theories. Been. So many conspiracy theories today. <laughs> I, I don't know why. I, I'm sorry, but I Bella think I'm, I'm letting Bella all Johnson. out. I'm letting all all out today. I really think that there's something with like eyeglasses or or LASIK or something like that with with, with Memo because he has great reflexes, but feels like anything away from him, he's like, all right, ball's coming, bounce in, <laughs> like. I don't know something that's there. No, but but the thing the thing with Memo that is interesting, I think, in the first weeks with Granada is is how much touches he gets on the ball. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, you basically see him play as a sweeper at certain plays. Yeah. You know, and I think that is something that Osorio will like. You know, considering what Osorio's philosophy is. You know, so that boosts his possibilities of being the ultimate starter uh, from now to <laughs> you know until Osorio remains. <laughs> as Actually, the head coach for two weeks from now, uh, I'm putting uh, my. Uh, I just November then. It's not confirmed. <laughs> <Until November. laughs> I'm, still right, March. I'm still saying March. March is when he's gonna get fired. That's what I'm saying. 
Oh, interesting. We <laughs> count down oh, to, to the countdown. Fire. Do you have a bet on how long Del Sorio's When it will Del Sorio be, be fired? After it's the U.S. game? After the Panama game? game? After five do- five dollars after each. losing to New Zealand, <laughs> okay, the pencils, the pencils aren't even worth that much anymore. Tom, are you sure you want to be betting five dollars? It's been much, then. All right, um, <laughs> on the chat, everyone having fun, already talking. Uh, <laughs> we saw conspiracy 2016, Illuminati. This we were going crazy. All right, uh, let's go ahead and talk about Liga MX. Uh, obviously, we have two. Jornada's coming up. If you didn't know, there's, it starts tomorrow. But before that, Nacho Ambriz is finally out. Uh, it was shared yesterday. The team no longer needs his services. And very much so, because I was trying to look at any type of excuse to see if this guy could keep going. But one of the worst defenses, most goal scored, a team that's got the most yellow and red cards. The team is a mess. When, and I'm, I'm trying to realize, when was the last time I saw a good America? In the Cruz Azul game, it was because Cruz Azul is just bad. <laughs> and what happened? It wasn't like America went overboard because there's also the exp- las expulsiones. Um, I have to say, you know, Leon just going in there, demolishing them at Chivas. Uh, it's definitely warranted that that, uh, that Nacho Ambriz is out. The only problem is now Nacho Ambriz is out and who is coming in. Naive, you're in El DF. What are you hearing from Cuapa, from El Nido? Of all the, of this situation, obviously, that we've seen, the fans are happy with Nacho Ambriz, which I ultimately think shouldn't have been a coach that uh, should have – I don't think he did anything to, to warrant it, you know, a, a team like like America. But what's going on in the DF con todos los americanistas? No, well, I think right now it's a, a scenario that we haven't seen or experienced while Pelais has been the sporting president. You know, Pelais – Yes, his decision on bringing Ambris is probably the most questionable decision he's made. Uh, but, you know, he has that those two leagues, one with Piojo, one with Mohamed, two Conca champions, one with Matosas and one with Ambris, that gives him the, you know, the legitimacy to his tenure as the president of America. Because before Pelais, America was a laughing stock in Liga MX. I think we have to recognize that. When Pelais comes in, some order yeah, is sort of inserted. Is, how long is- is he going to keep saying that? Like in his press no, conference, no, oh, I, I, thing, I, I let yeah. the, you know, I'd raise the bar, and I, and, and he was betting on Nacho Ambriz to be good, and he didn't fail. The thing, the thing, the thing is that uh, he, th- what I see is that he did mess up with the Ambriz decision. I think Ambriz should have been removed from the coaching job since December of 2015, after the Club World Cup disaster, where they lost to a Chinese team, and Darwin Quintero and Sambuesa were basically fighting on the field. Uh, that's the moment where you know that Ambriz really didn't have it. You know, he didn't have control of the team. So you leave him for six months afterwards and you do win the Conca Champions, but you still see the same certain details. You know, there's always expulsiones. There's certain players that are not playing at their maximum potential, like Ruben Sambuesa, who's the captain of the team and should, you know, show more. Um, and I think he, he, that, that's the, that's the, that's the, that's where every, everything got messed up. And I think after the three zero against Chivas, that's when Ambriz should have left. You wasted yeah. two, two, you wasted uh, a lot of time. There. I mean, I know, I know everybody's going crazy about, oh, you know, he was never the right manager, blah, blah, blah. It's like, sometimes you look at the cold odd stats, they're on the same amount of points as Chivas. Exactly. And everyone's going crazy about Almeda. They're, they're still in a playoff spot. They're in seventh position in the league. And I, I do understand, though, however, I do understand the way Chivas defeated him. You know, that, that it's, it's a massive deal. And it's the same centennial. Way, and I do understand. Centennial, yeah. Yeah, and the, and the centennial. And I do, I, you know, I do understand that going back to the hiring of, of Van Brees, you know, it was never popular. But I also feel that Van Brees was never... Nobody wanted him from the beginning. Well, even that, it's difficult to work in that, in that environment. Um, but, I mean, you know place won the CONCACAF Champions League you know in you know he's, he's had he's not been very lucky this season because his best striker Oribe Peralta is, was injured he's had Darwin Quintero who's been out he's had Samudia who's a he's a brilliant left back who's really key to the way America plays has been injured I mean is it you know like Sam West has not been on form it's like there's other factors as well. It's not just like Ambrose isn't an Americanista. He's never going to do with the. It's, there's other factors you know, that are it's, it's like right now we were joking about the Osorio situation, but when we compare the scenario on L3 and we compare the scenario at America, it's really the same. I mean, I think that's Similar, the second yeah. hot seat in Mexico. It's like this whole media pressure of, of sort of painting 
a bad side of Ambriz that he really not capable enough really took a toll and I think did play a role in the decision making from the higher ups. I'm not talking yeah. about Pelais, I'm talking about the, the ones that are way above and, and saw that everything was sort of, of sort of falling out of out of control, getting out of control. Because look, the, the last four games at home have been horrible. I mean, it's three losses, you know, nine goals conceded. Only it's the one Azteca. Scored. It's the Azteca. Yes. Move them out it's of the Azteca. Azteca curse. No? Move, move Club America out of the Azteca let's and go see play. Let's play Monterrey. Let's see America play. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, and let's see let's see if that works out. <laughs> no, no, I, no I, I agree with it, like, you know, what, what Naive was saying. And you, I mean, it, it's just, it was interesting that, like, uh, but he, he had to, he was defending himself from day one. You know, from the very, yeah. very beginning, he had to defend himself. And it's just, I, I think I think it is a little unfortunate. As, you know, as Thomas mentioned, too, they're still in, they're still in seventh place. They're still in a playoff spot. But just the expectations that that club has, expectations that the fans have, and especially when you consider that it's, you know, it's going to be the hundred year anniversary. I think that all plays into this factor of uh, yeah. him being dropped. Although, wow. it, yeah, like, like Dave said, it's a little strange with the when they dropped him. I would have assumed that if they were going to drop him, they would have should have done it, you know, right before the international break, yeah. or during you know, before the season started, or after the Club World Cup, uh, you know, disaster. Here's let, let me let me throw something out there. Let me throw something out there. I was gonna On one football school. today. It was uh, on one football. There was um, there was an article, a little video about um, you know the same the same thing that I mentioned before about Televisa, saying that basically Club America is losing a lot of money for Televisa right now, you know, and we've seen over the last few years the America not quite spending as much on players, you know, going for going for different players, not bringing in a star for the centennial. You know, hiring someone like Ambrice, who is obviously going to be getting lower wages, even yeah, like lies. Yeah, you got Pelais in there who's kind of, you know, his job's been kind of to do as much as possible with, I'm not going to say as little as possible because they've still spent quite a lot of money, yeah, but you you know, let's just throw that in. Is America the same economic powerhouse? When you look at Tigres and the money they're throwing around, you look at Monterrey and the international, you know, South American internationals they bought, even Chivas spending millions and millions of dollars on Pulido. The, you have to ask the question as well. And again, it's like, I'm not saying Ambriz was the ideal candidate, but how much of that was 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 to do with America's you know failure to to, to really light up this appetite? I, I do see a change of philosophy when it when when or ideology when uh, when Pelais comes in because he sort of relies on foreign Mexican no oh, for uh, p- potential what's the word uh, players that already proven themselves in Liga Mex. I mean we see that with Quintero. Yeah. We see yeah. that with Silvio Romero, mm-hmm. with William da Silva, with Oribe Peralta. You know, but before before Pelais was in. You know, in the 1980s, for example, America would go to South America and just pick out, oh, Russo Brailovsky is really good, so let's bring him to America. Or, or, you know, even in the 1990s and early 2000s, you know, Bam Bam Zamorano and, and Piojo Lopez, you know, who came from Valencia. You know, I think, I think with Pelais as the main guy, you know, that totally changed. I mean, that was not, never going to happen. <laughs> bring someone, you know, someone important from, from South America or even Europe. It, it, it's it's changing sort of the way they see the thing, and 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 unfortunately, it hasn't worked out in the league for two years because in you know in 2014 they won the league with Turco Mohamed. I mean, I think it has to do also with the coaching selection, in my opinion, because Pio Herrera and Turco Mohamed had the attitude, had that fire that makes them stand out as coaches. Ambriz doesn't have that. I mean, let's not forget that Ambriz over there in Querétaro failed to sort of control Ronaldinho. I mean, because it was a good team Bucetich. before that. It was a good team. It was going in the playoffs, and Ronaldinho came and he just couldn't do it. And then Bucetich comes in and takes the team to the takes, to the final. Takes so, the so, out. Yeah. So I mean, it's it, it's it's you got to pick the right people for 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 the job. And I think Ambriz really was eaten by the pressure. I think. I think it also has to do a lot with Pelais. Pelais came in and kind of went like, "We're not the greatest club." If I remember that, they're taking the slogan out. You know, somos el mejor or whatever the slogan was before Pelais came out. And kind of brought it back to reality, guys. We, we, it's Nerica isn't as big, you know, right now. We're not playing great football and kind of honed it down, brought it back. And what he did was great, you know, with Turco Mohamed and, and Piojo, especially with Piojo. And then obviously going to the national team. I think also Pelaez is kind of like, he's like, you know, this messiah of America and what they, what he've done that he needs to kind of step down and go, this Nacho Ambriz decision is pretty bad. Bringing in 
over 40, 50, play, I think almost 50 players um, for, uh, for America, you know, and players that have not worked out. So I think also, you know, a little humble pie for Mr. Pelais. Um, from now what we're seeing, uh, our viewers uh, here on the chat have told us about Ruben Romano Ma. I'm sorry, uh, Romero Ma Romero. He is now the coach officially. Univision is uh, already saying that uh, the Argentine coach will be coming back. Ruben Omar Romano is el nuevo entrenador de la América. How does that fit in? And is there a coaching problem? It goes back to the coaching problems in Mexico uh, because what, what we were hearing, uh, La Volpe, um, Tena, you know, even it's like these recycled coaches coming back in who haven't, haven't, hasn't done anything. I still think Romano's better than, than Ambriz from what he at least had in, in tenure, at least with the Liga MX, but it doesn't give you this great comfortable, oh, we're going to have, can't wait to hear, to see this America with Romano coming in, Tom, what's, uh, no. what's up with that? No idea. I mean, I think it, it's very difficult to understand. <laughs> Why? Because you're talking about arguably Mexico's biggest club, its most successful club. And at the end of the day, you want to hire a coach who's kind of like, you know, if you were to draw a graph of his career, then it'd be on the rise. You know what I mean? It'd be like, oh, you know, somebody who's coming in and going to build on, on something they've already achieved. And you're like, look at Romano, Romano and it's like, He's shown absolutely nothing in recent years that he is the person to coach Club America. I mean, absolutely nothing. It's a very, very strange decision for me. I mean, do I think he's going to do terribly? No, because no. America have got a good team. What they've reached the last what ten playoffs? I mean, it's an incredible record. Yeah. You know, the 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 core of the team is is solid. Romano is obviously he's okay as a coach, but I mean, how the hell he's got the job? difficult to explain i mean i think Pelais more than anything he's, he's got to explain that decision and 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 obviously not to me but I but, but, but tom and and, and we, tonight, this goes back to your, this goes back to that point that you brought up about televisa you know how much money is this going to the team and how much how much interest there is in the team right now i mean of course why not you know, over I mean, here over here in mexico they say that 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 the reason that azteca got the renovations done which are not that pretty by the way oh is gosh the is coming. started with that it's because like, the NFL is coming. Had the NFL not yeah. decided to come to Mexico City, there was not going to be renovations at Estadio Azteca. You know, this is this is this is a. It, it doesn't look critical right now because America is still in the Giga zone, like Cesar said. But mm -hmm. let's see and, and 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 what happens in December after the Club World Cup. You know, because if Pelais leaves the club, then America has to start all over again. Why you know, not give the scratch? Why not give? I think, who, who's coaching tomorrow? The game is it the sub twenty uh, coach? Israel, Israel, yeah, Israel, right? Use twenty so, coach. Why not keep him? Right, keep him until you find the time to get a good coach, or you know, for a while uh, at least of the season, and give and look for that. I mean, it's like no, no, I feel like I feel like Ambris. Why not keep Ambris oh, until the end of the season? Well, no, because because obviously there's. I mean, what <laughs> I would think maybe Israel has more experience, um, but you know, why not do that and 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 just wait it out. And seeing, or you know, and seeing into in, in, into what happens instead of just making this reaction, you know, it's when, keep you see, when you see Romano, I mean, it, this is this is not to Who's justify left? the decision. This is not to justify the decision, but he's a la volpista. He's a la volpista like Piojo Herrera. Who of course, he? not with the same not with the same success rate as Piojo Herrera, but that idea is gonna return. The five three two with America is gonna be the formation that we're gonna see with Romano, and that's you know, it could help. <laughs> But like Tom said, there are injuries. Samudio's out. You know, Darwin Quintero, we still don't know exactly when he's going to come back. You know, we'll see if it works out. What happened? Uh, Cesar, you were able to see Roman over there at Cholos? Yeah. It was horrible, no? Two and a I, mean, who, I mean, who really, when you hear that name, I mean, it doesn't ex exactly bring up good, really, it doesn't really bring up, like, positive emotions. It doesn't really think of someone that you'd really trust. I think, uh, I mean, you could just see what people have been talking about him online, at least through Twitter, because he's been the rumored option, you know, for a little bit now. Yeah. No one's. Re it hasn't really been met with, with a lot of positive responses, and I can only imagine if it is. But has has is it actually beneficial? I don't know if anybody's it's checked not, out. It's checked not, I don't think it's official from the club yet. From the so club I wonder if 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 it were to become official, you could only imagine. I mean, if people react a certain way towards Abris, how people would react towards uh, Ruben Omar Romano? Guys, who is really out there though? Let's just say, let's just say we have a great television is doing amazing. Everything's great. They want to get this great coach. Who is really out there? There are no Mexican coaches that I could be like, you know, or, and I think that's where Pelaez 
give credit for him gambling on 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 Nacho Ambriz. It went bad. I'll give him like, all right, he's gutsy. You know, they're trying to do this kind of this popular thing that's going around the world and giving a a, a a coach, you know, with a different philosophy that's working for some. It's not working for some. But I just feel like who is out there that they could re- that that Americanistas would really be happy? Oh, well, okay, yeah, yeah. The coaching, the coaching, well, it's always Bielsa that's out there, but Aguirre? Yeah, Aguirre I mean, is you know, Aguirre's having a great time in the Middle East. Yeah, and he'd be making a, a lot of money there as well. Aguirre. Yeah, and, 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 and he said um, today, he said today that, you know, that's that he, if he's, or I think I remember him saying that if he's going to come back, he's going to come back as a, you know, as a federativo or yeah. directivo or something like that. And, but who, there's really not the Hugo Sanchez, throw it out there, you know, mm. would, would be a good signing that's for them, but. Maybe, just, maybe, but he's, I think he's better than Romano. I well, mean, yeah, I don't, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Are there no, are there no younger coaches around? I mean, you know, I think, and again, you know, Nacho Ambriz, I think he's been given a bad rep by this stint at America as well. He's actually, if you if you listen to him speak, and you know, probably not as much as at America, but with his previous club, he's actually quite good at playing the scientific side of the game. He's, you know, he's good at all that stuff. He's like obviously learned his stuff abroad as well. He's like. He's quite uh, enlightened about the game. It's just a shame that um, you know he's just been so battered by by being America coach. But yeah, it, I agree completely. We saw it is uh, very worrying that you know Club America Belize can't have a look around and there's no you know 35, 40 year old you know Mexican upcoming coach because I tell you what, there are Argentines. You know, yeah, yeah, you yeah, see yeah. all over the place. The thing, the thing here is, is because of the odd things that happen in Mexico. Is there is a guy by the name of Cuauhtémoc Blanco being the Ooh. mayor Who's that? of Cuernavaca at the moment. You know, had 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 Cuauhtémoc Blanco not wasted that year and a half he's been wasting over there in Morelos. This is what this was the moment. This was a moment where Cuauhtémoc Blanco as a coach. Could have, I know. Well, that, yes. Nah, yeah, nah, nah. Can you imagine yeah. that? This is like I mean, I mean, Diego Maradona. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or, or you know, Almeida just got no. through in there with the river plate. No, you know, like in Argentina, Palermo, I've, Palermo, no? I've had this. Gallardo, I've had, Gallardo. I've had this I'm, conversation. Gallardo, just throw him in there. I've had this conversation with a bunch of you know a lot of people about why there are no coaches or player coachings, and I, and you've seen that all the players are on the ninety fours, ninety eight, you know, eighty, you know, um, eighty six World Cup. You see Javier Aguirre, you see Hugo Sanchez. You see, you know, um, Denas. You see all those old ex players that became coaches. Then there's this huge gap of non players that be, that uh, you know didn't take that. For example, you know Jorge Campos, who was with La Volpe during the World Cup years. Claudio you know, Suarez. Claudio Suarez. Pablo Pablo. Pablo, why not? A lot of them went to the TV. Yeah, I'll say why want to do broadcast. No, no, no. Right? But no, but we. So I no. I think I think that's the I think that's the wrong way around though. I think they want. They would love. I mean, I spoke to both of those people recently. In but, the last couple of months, but they, but they, I, the they have to start at the bottom. To go in them. They have to start at the bottom. They have to start with small clubs. They have to start, or because here, I feel like they're here. Not necessarily, though. I mean, not necessarily. But I think that's why. I mean, if you if you look at Televisa, you look at you look at Univision, you look at all those players that are in these talk shows that are getting paid a ton of money. You know, and I feel like that's where that 94, 98, 2002 generation went. No, yeah, they definitely are there. But I just I think I think the FMF and Liga MX clubs as well. For some reason, they haven't wanted to hire those people. You know, I, I mean, I don't know the reason. Maybe it is a financial thing. But I mean, for example, this Club America job. I mean, if people have talk, have heard Pavel Pardo talk about the game, and you know, he, he came into the Atlas system under Bielsa. He can talk for hours about Bielsa. You know, <laughs> he, and then La Volpe and and you know stuff like that. I mean, I mean, he's obviously a student of the game. It's like I don't know. I mean. Yeah. I mean, there, 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 I singular, feel, just... there, there, there are singular cases. For example, uh, right now, one that stands out, in my opinion, in Mexico is the case of, of Jimmy Lozano. I mean, you guys remember Jimmy Lozano was yeah. one of the players for La Volpe. Well, right now, Jimmy Lozano, you know, he won the U20s uh, championship last season with Querétaro, and now he's assistant of Bucetich in Querétaro. That's a process right there. Yeah, he and came, it, he went U20s, a... mm-hmm. now assistant, and then hopefully... Probably the thing Paco. is, I, I get the sense that a lot of a lot of Mexican coaches get stagnated in the Liga de Ascenso. Now, there's one name that stands out: Tiburón Sanchez, for example, who was actually a student of Osorio. You know, he he prepared himself with Osorio for a couple of years, and he's always been in Ascenso Mex. And there's no Liga Mex team that has looked at him and been like, "All right, let's give him a shot and see what he has." Um, 
Maybe once, Turco to Mohamed gets, maybe once Turco Mohamed gets fired within the next month or so. There you go. Bring him over to America and see what happens. Bring him back. <laughs> it's it. I, I just think it's a huge inter- huge like we haven't seen those coaches come through, and uh, we see those players on TV all the time. And hopefully, 2006, Jimmy Lozano, Paco Palencia, who's there. You know, we're starting to see that group. Rafael Marquez. You know what? You know, bringing on what he has, all the experience that he have. Why not start? Why not get a degree? You know, in the, in, in in coaching universities that are around the world. Why not go work in the Barcelona youth system or something like where you can come back and study and have you know those coaches abroad? And we've seen that too, Tom. We've had these conversations. Piojo, for example, should have gone to you know those offers that were in Europe somewhere or those small or those teams to to see that top opposition. That's, it's that's, the money. Yeah, that's a bigger problem that we've talked about before. That just like the players, you know, you it's the money you get. You get comfortable. Why take that risk? You might get paid less, or you could just stay over here, get a decent amount of cash. You don't have to yeah. learn a new language. You don't have to adjust to a different lifestyle. You could just hang out in Mexico. You get a, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Why? Why isn't Potro Potro Gutierrez, Potro Gutierrez going to you know to a team in Europe or or looking for coaching jobs? I I, I believe that there are. And it's just. But, I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> let's solve. Let's I mean, solve Mexican you know, soccer on the Mexican side. But Potro Gutierrez is is he is he good? I don't know. The, the, I mean, the Olympics was awful. I would say. Oh, I'm just saying. Well, if he he had some success with the with the with the sub 17s, you know, why not take that over abroad and learn more before you come back? Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I know I agree. I agree with what you're saying. We saw about him working up and stuff. But I just feel like it's the Mexican league. It's not like, you know, you're not going straight to La Liga. It's like something like no. the Argentines do, like like Gallardo and Almeida. River Plate just hire them. They finish the career and they're just like, all right, it's you also, understand the philosophy of our club, you know. Um, but you then again, the you know, it's also because maybe, those guys are very like, and isn't that what happened, Nacho Ambriz? I mean, you know, in, in Paco Palencia, you know, you saw at least those type of hirings and maybe they should give more, 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 let's have those type of hirings. And you saw Paco Palencia come through Pumas, a, a person, I think that's where I made that came in with, you know, with his club and they're giving that chance to say that Cuauhtémoc Blanco should be America's coach with no experience in coaching. No, no, but, but that's why I'm saying that he wasted a year there. I mean, he could have prepared himself, you know, adequately to be ready for the I, job. But then we're going to have a coach, man. <laughs> nah, nah, I, I actually right, I, see something. I would, I would, whether, whether it would work or not, I would love to see Blanco as a coach. <laughs> no. Really he should, the, should he comes back and coaches the Chicago Fire. And... <laughs> but, but, just, just like final thing on, on, on this topic. I mean, it's pretty depressing that, mm-hmm. you know, you've got a Mexican coach who's seventh place in the league who leaves. And I know there's the whole American Easter thing, but, you know, he's got a team in seventh place on course to to make the playoffs and then he gets fired and you bring in Romano you know you an Argentine who basically if he went to Argentina what job would he get he's not going to get a top job with Boca or River no. but yet in Mexico <laughs> for some strange reason he's got the top job I mean arguably the best job in club football in Mexico Romano has got on the basis of doing very little over the last five years and it's that's depressing for Mexican coaches out there, especially the young ones. <laughs> On the chat, people are saying the reason why Rafa is not going to be a coach is because he's still going to be playing for El 3 2022. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, guys. I know we're going over a lot, but uh, really quick on uh, what's coming up with Liga MX. Uh, games of the week tomorrow. Uh, definitely Tigres and Chivas. I'm definitely excited to see that. I mean, um, uh, you know, Alme- um, Pulido scoring over the weekend, coming back to his former club. There is the drama that we love to see. And then, so if you guys don't know, Liga MX is tomorrow. And then over the weekend. Uh, tomorrow and Wednesday. Uh, yeah, tomorrow and Wednesday. And then over the weekend, Pumas America. Right? Pumas America on Saturday, oh, yeah. Is, uh, which, which, so lots and lots of football. But anything else? What's going on with Tucro Mohamed in Monterrey? I mean, this is supposed to be a great team last year. And uh, what's happening, uh, you know, Almost in the same level as Leon. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I think you could make really quickly. Just, I think you could make some comparison between the two with some of the injuries that have really hurt the team. You know, and, 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 and I also said yeah. that the, the thing about the injuries, you know, the two finalists, I think, from last season had injuries. You know, mm-hmm. Pachuca with Franco yep. Jara and Rodolfo Pizarro. However, mm-hmm. Pachuca is still stable with Rayados. I just everything's been crazy in Rayados because. I think one of the decisions that was interesting in the last weeks over there is that uh, Luis Miguel Salvador, you know, the, the club's president, uh, will step down after December, and he's been there for 15 years. You know, he's mainly the reason why 
Monterrey has been this great club, you know, with that, those years with Bucetich. Mm -hmm. um, so I, it, it's quite strange over there with Rayados. I mean, it, it, all that, all that, you know, driven squad that they have, and they can get the wins. Yeah, there's a lot of pressure too. Like I think that uh, and I wrote about this too. I think a lot, a lot of the players too who are busy with the uh, either. I think they had a total of eight players either in the in the Copa America or in the Olympics. And I think that with the injuries, and I think I think that that's how to play. But that is a good point to say with Pachuca, how they're still doing a decent. I mean, they're not doing amazing. I don't I don't even know if they've exceeded expectations. They're still in fourth place, but no, that's a good point, though. All right, guys. I know we've gone out. Is anybody jumping in the Monarcas train yet? I mean, so until they win, like not, until they win not, the championship, not, not until they make the semis. You know, if, if they, if Morelia until they, until beats, they make the Morelia, final. If Morelia beats Pachuca, then there's something to think about if, there. But if you know, Mor Tom, if Tom Morelia wins the whole Liga MX, will anyone still jump on the Monarcas <laughs> train? I mean, let's no, let's be honest. They're, they're underrated. I will. No, I, I think we often admit they're an under. I think they're an underrated roster. They're underrated team, man. I know, no, I, no, no, I, matter, I, no, no, I, I, I don't, I don't think they're that good. I just think Messi's done a really good job. I think he's done a brilliant job. I mean, I really do. I think we, he should I, be really praised the way he's achieved. I mean, that. I think, I think if we compare, I think Hector Huerta from Football Picante said something this week, and that America and Morelia have the same number of points at this right now. If we take the points from the Clausura and the Apertura. So, I mean, that tells you a little bit about how impressive Morelia has been. Yeah, they might get relegated. No, well, they're not looking <laughs> like that. And that was a good win for them on the relegation. Um, cheery end from Cesar. Nice cheery end there. <laughs> Where's Ramoncito Morales right now? That's why That's things good. are happening. Oh, I think Coras. Coras, no? There you Coras. go. There you go. 2007, 2008 type of player, I'm telling you. All right, guys, great, great show. Thank you, uh, all everyone on the chat watching us and listening to us. You can definitely listen to us on uh, on iTunes, where uh, this podcast will be broadcast on Tuesday and Wednesday. Thank you to Mr. Tom Marshall, Mr. Naive, uh, Mr. Cesar. Uh, really quick, uh, Johnny Reeker wanted us to say that uh, he's feeling under the weather. No, his exact quote was he wanted to talk about he's really happy that Nacho Ambriz is out. But hearing the the Romano news, he got sick and he couldn't come on the show. So uh, that's uh, that's officially from Mr. Johnny Rico. Well, guys, great, great show. We'll see you all next week on another edition of Monday Night Football with here on the Mexican Soccer Show. Follow us and also uh, subscribe to the channel, guys. I'll give it to Mr. Tom Marshall to close us off today. Tom, tell everybody goodbye. You can make it in cool. tune with the music. It'll be perfect. Let me get the rhythm. No, I can't get it. <laughs> TUSB Tigres tomorrow night. TUSB Tigres, perhaps the best game in the regular season. That's my prediction. It's going to be incredible. Don't miss it. All right. There it is.